Hey, everybody. We're going to start the webinar promptly at 2 o'clock, so in about nine minutes.
Hey, can the Calor Cycle folks turn on their webcams? We'll start promptly at two o'clock. Okay, so it's now two o'clock. So as people trickle in, I'm just going to do some quick introductions before we get this started. Um, so welcome everyone to the SB 1383 Organics Waste Recycling Capacity Planning Tool Webinar. That is a mouthful. Um, my name is Ashley Yee. I'm Calorie Cycles SB 1383 Implementation Manager. And before I turn it over to Jeffrey to go over the logistics of the webinar, and provide some background content for the tool. I wanted to introduce you to everyone who will be presenting and are available to respond to questions at the end. Um, so Calorie Recycle folks, if you have on your webcam, please wave hi when I call your name. Um, so from Calorie Recycle, we have Kara Morgan, Chris Bria, and Julia Doloff, representing capacity planning, collections and various other 1383 sections as you've probably seen their faces before. A big thank you also to Julia for handling the logistics of the webinar. It takes tons of planning, working with our IT staff um, and getting out everything uh, pre actually doing the webinar. We also have Jeffrey McDaniel who's representing capacity planning and will be doing some of our presentation. We have Dan Brown, representing the Waste Characterization Studies and RDRS. And we also have Esmeralda Alvarero and Ray Carranza helping with the live Q&A portion. So thank you to them uh, for stepping up and doing that. So now I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff, who's gonna go over the logistics as well as provide some background content for capacity planning. So take it away, Jeff. Thank you, Ashley. Hi, Tate. Um, today, I'm going to go over the organic waste recycling capacity planning requirements and tie in how cities and counties might use our organics capacity planning calculator to meet some of those requirements. And then Chris Braille will walk us through a tutorial of the calculator. We will then follow up with Q&A. So feel free to submit questions into the comment box so that we can address them after the presentations. I'll start by describing how the Q&A sessions will work so you could submit your questions throughout the, my presentation and the tool overview. For those participating in the GoToWebinar platform, please type your questions into the question pane. If you're watching the webinar through the Cal EPA broadcast, please email your questions to the SLCP inbox. Cal Recycle staff members Esmeralda and Ray will unmute participates, participants in order that the questions come in so that you may ask your questions out loud. If you do not have a microphone, please note that when you submit your question so that we may ask the question for you. If those with a microphone, or sorry, for those with a microphone, you'll need to unmute yourself on your end when asked by Esmeralda and Ray. Please remember to state your affiliation before asking your question. Cal Recycle staff, may respond to some questions in writing to the GoToWebinar platform. So for those listening via the webcast, we will verbalize these questions and written responses for all to hear. Questions and comments regarding the merit of the regulations were responded to during the rulemaking period. Therefore, today we will be focusing on questions and clarifications regarding implement, implementation and tools. So with that, I'll move into an overview of the organic waste recycling capacity planning requirements to get us started. Each jurisdiction, meaning each county, city, regional agency, and special district that provides solid waste collection services within the county must plan for adequate capacity for recycling organic waste. Each county will lead this effort by coordinating with the jurisdictions located within the county. It is important to note that 
when there is a CalRecycle approved regional agency, that regional agency functions as the main coordinating entity with the unincorporated county and cities. However, the JPA for the regional agency will need to revise, will need to be revised to incorporate 1383 responsibilities. Each county is responsible for establishing a collaborative approach to this planning, including setting a timeline, identifying tasks, and determining what each jurisdiction tasks are. Each county is responsible for collecting the organic waste recycling capacity planning information from each jurisdiction, submitting the organic waste recycling capacity report to CalRecycle, identifying any jurisdiction, including itself, that does not have enough organic waste recycling capacity, and informing that applicable individual jurisdiction that does not have capacity about the timeline for submitting the implementation schedule, which is within 120 days from when the county submits the report to CalRecycle. Counties are not responsible for ensuring and enforcing each of the cities located within the county conduct the organic waste recycling capacity planning that is required. This coordination might be done in different ways depending on what the needs are and what the availability for resources are. So for example, the county might lay out all the tasks that need to be accomplished by each jurisdiction and the timelines. The county might check in with each of the jurisdictions to check on the statuses so that they know what will be submitted in time for the county to complete the report to our cycle. The county might set up a process so that each jurisdiction can submit the data to the county, such as using Google Docs or some other system to submit the needed information. The county might identify some tasks that will be that will complete for each of the jurisdiction. For example, the county might take the lead on coordinating with some of the required entities, such as the county might reach out to the LEA or uh, for information about all proposed projects that the LEA is uh, aware of in the jurisdictions. Each jurisdiction is responsible for conducting the requirements shown on this and the next slide. The purpose of this planning is for each jurisdiction to determine for each entity how much organic waste will be disposed and how much existing, planned, or new organic waste recycling capacity is needed for the organic waste material that is collected from the collection program. CalRecycle developed an extensive online calculator to assist you in this part of the process. As this information is collected, the online calculator tool can be utilized to record and calculate disposal and projected disposal by material type, as well as existing capacity by facility type, new or expanded capacity by facility type, and any shortfall in capacity. The capacity planning requirements do not require estimates to be exact or absent of any error or uncertainty. Rather, it requires that each estimate is conducted in compliance with the requirements of this section. The county is the coordinating entity for all the capacity planning tasks because the county is responsible for submitting a report on capacity planning to CalRecycle. However, each of these tasks is expected to be done by each individual jurisdiction. Capacity planning efforts will be crucial to the state achieving SB 1383's targets and the capacity planning requirements were intended to be a cooperative and communicative effort throughout the entities in the county. Each jurisdiction must estimate the amount of all organic waste in tons that will be disposed by each of the jurisdictions within the county. Each jurisdiction must identify the amount in tons of existing organic waste recycling infrastructure capacity located in the county and outside of the county that is verifiably available to each of the jurisdictions located in the county. Each jurisdiction can demonstrate the capacity is verifiably available through a contract, franchise, or other documentation of existing, new, or expanded capacity at a facility, activity, operation, or property. 
that recovers organic waste that will be available to the county or its jurisdiction prior to the end of the reporting period. Each jurisdiction must estimate the amount of new or expanded organic waste recycling uh, facility capacity that will be needed to process the organic waste estimated to be disposed. This requirement provides jurisdictions with the ability to identify how much additional capacity they will need at new or existing facilities that are inside or outside of its boundaries and assist in identifying capacity at facilities that may become oversubscribed if jurisdictions identify the same facilities. Because this effort requires regional coordination, each of the cities that are contracted by the county staff, or sorry, that are contacted by the county staff must respond to the request for information within 120 days. If this timeline is not met, the county does not need to include estimates for that jurisdiction that provides solid waste collection service in its report to Cal Recycle. However, the county must include in its report any jurisdiction that did not provide the necessary information to comply with the requirements. This is needed because the county can be penalized financially for failing to estimate organic waste capacity, and this clarifies that the county is not liable if the cities located in the county fail to respond within the given time frame. In complying with this section, the county, in coordination with each jurisdiction, is required to engage with important entities that play a role in organic waste recycling capacity planning efforts. Such engagement will provide more accuracy in determining the organic waste capacity needed to meet the reduction in organic waste disposal goals required by statute. Each jurisdiction should determine who will contact the following important entities, such as the local enforcement agency, the local task force, haulers, facility owners, and community composting operations. Jurisdictions that host facilities that generate digestate, such as in, an in-vessel digester, and biosolids uh, generated at wastewater treatment plants are required to have a plan for the recycling capacity for these materials. Any of the entities contacted by a jurisdiction must respond within 60 days and include in, including information about thoroughput and permitted capacity necessary for planning purposes to ensure the capacity planning requirements can be met in a timely manner. Consult with community composting operations is also required to provide an opportunity to consult with small scale community composting operators that may be able to recycle organic waste outside of the conventional organic waste processing infrastructure. This collaboration will provide CalRecycle with the ability to ensure that jurisdictions are involving local communities in their capacity planning efforts. Each jurisdiction is required to conduct community outreach regarding locations being considered for new or expanded facilities, operations, or activities to seek feedback on the benefits and impacts that may be associated with new or expanded facilities, operations, or activities. The intention for the community outreach is that it would be conducted by the jurisdiction in which the expanded or new facility operation or activity is located. With that said, as with other consultations, the county and jurisdictions should decide how and by whom community outreach will be handled if there is a new or expanded facility operation or activity. However, nothing precludes cities from providing outreach on their own. This outreach requirement was included in the regulations to facilitate feedback from the community during the planning process. The community outreach must meet a certain specific certain specifications to ensure thorough and authentic engagement on this requirement. If a jurisdiction's data determines that organic recycling capacity is needed, the county is required to notify each jurisdiction that lacks sufficient capacity that the jurisdiction is required to submit an implementation schedule to CalRecycle that demonstrates 
how the jurisdiction will ensure available capacity to recover the organic waste disposed by generators within their jurisdiction by the end of the period. The implementation schedule must include timelines and milestones for planning efforts to access capacity, including one, obtaining funding for infrastructure through modifying franchise agreements or other means of financially supporting the expansion of organic waste recycling, and two, identifying existing locations that could be used for additional capacity and identifying locations for proposed or expanded organic waste recycling facilities that will be used to recycle organic waste. The county is required to notify each jurisdiction that lacks sufficient capacity, but the county has reported a list of these jurisdictions recycle. For capacity planning, organic waste shall only include the following types of materials. Food, green waste, landscape and pruning waste, wood, paper products, printing and writing, writing paper, digestate, and biosolids. When jurisdictions are engaged in organic waste recycling capacity planning outlined in this section, the focus is on these particular organic waste types rather than the larger group of materials that comprise of organic waste. A jurisdiction that receives a waiver from the department does not have to plan for organic waste capacity for the area that is waived. The county is not required to obtain information from a jurisdiction that is waived from all the organic waste collection requirements. Capacity planning for locations that are exempted from providing required collection services are not required to be included in the county's capacity planning estimates, as those locations will not be contributing to the county's organic waste totals. And that concludes the organic waste capacity planning presentation. If you have questions, concerns, or require clarity regarding the information presented here today, please Leave your questions and comments in the comment box or email the SLCP contact shown on this slide. We will do our best to address all questions after Chris Brea gives us a guided tour of the calculator. Thank you. Hold on, sorry, I'm just trying to make sure I pick the right screen. Okay, I got it. Hello, everyone. My name's Chris Bria. I work in local assistance and market development, along with Jeff and Kara. Uh, you might remember me from edible food capacity planning uh, last Thursday. <laughs> I've worked on both of these tools, and you will see that they are quite different uh, given the different needs uh, of the different capacity planning uh, requirements. So first off, I'm gonna show you how to navigate to the tool from the CalRecycle homepage. If you scroll down a little bit under new SB 1383 resources, you can press learn more. And as of today, you know, it's not gonna be the biggest news on the planet forever, but as of right now, you can jump straight to the capacity planning tools and guidance under the program news box on the main SLC, SLCP page. And from here, there's some other background information that you just heard from Jeff. It's all kind of spelled out on this page. Um, if you scroll all the way to the bottom in the resources section, the first link uh, listed is for the Organic Waste Recycling Capacity Planning Calculator. Once again, there's some other background and notes regarding the regulations, as well as a reminder that this tool is optional. There's no requirement that it is used by any jurisdiction. Uh, we're hoping that you do use it because it's got a, a lot of great features that depending on how far along you may or may not be on your internal planning, there's a lot of options in here that you can probably use. 
Uh, not only is the tool itself optional, there's also some optional steps within the tool, and I will try to point those out as we go through it. So first off, I do want to put, uh, remind everyone that there are various tool tips located throughout the calculator. Uh, anytime you see a question mark box next to a field, you can click on it and it will open up another box with more information in it. Secondly, any item in the calculator that has a red asterisk next to it is a required field that needs to be filled out. Uh, there's not a whole lot of them. They're mostly at the top in the initial sort of prep sections. But if you see that anywhere, please make sure that a piece of data is in there. Also, we'd like to note that information in this calculator cannot be saved uh, after you're through using it. There is a button where you can export all the data to Excel. Um, a lot of the information in this calculator is not necessarily required to be reported back to CalRecycle in any way. What we really tried to do was build a very versatile tool that can be used by jurisdictions between, you know, from little places like Half Moon Bay all the way to giant counties like Los Angeles or San Diego. So as we go through it, you, there are certain parts where you might be like, oh, well, you know, that doesn't apply to us. Um, from, from our end, we had to build something that would be versatile enough to be used by every jurisdiction in the state that might need to use it. Uh, last up as a main disclaimer, as you'll see in this larger paragraph, uh, this page has an idle timer. So I literally just opened the page uh, as I navigated to it. And I had a timer that basically starts internally on the web page itself for 120 minutes. Um, as we Work through it, you may be wondering why there's so much text in certain places or why things are maybe set up the way they are. We have uh, website accessibility standards that we needed to meet. And so as a way to get some of the, the information to feed into the calculator, uh, certain steps had to be taken to make sure we still met our accessibility standards as well as maintain the tool that could be used. So as it says here, there's a 120 minute timer after that 120 minutes, if you stop using it for any longer period than around 15 minutes, you may experience a loss of data. Um, it's not ideal, but it's what we had to do to make sure that it would function as well as meet our website standards. So first up at the top, you would pick your disposal data year, um, and this is related to the year in which the associated reporting will take place. Um, and what this will do is right now it, it defaults to 2021 because that the 2021 report coming next year or when this is due next year, uh, 2021 will be the most up-to-date data that's available in the recycling and disposal reporting system. I'm gonna not keep saying that. I will start referring to RDRS uh, as I work through this because it's a mouthful to say every time. Um, so hopefully next year when we ha start having a full year of 2021 disposal data from our DRS ready, the idea would be that that data can feed in. But for now, you will have to manually input that data using either your 2020 information or what you estimate it might be in 2021. Um, when you pick your disposal data year, you'll notice to the right, it will change the period covered to correspond with you know, that disposal data year will be the most recent when the that the capacity planning report is due. So this will give you an indication of what years you're planning for. Uh, once again, up here at the top and some of the background, a layout of the, of the um, planning capacity requirements and what needs to be planned for for which year is available right there. So as I proceed through the rest of this, uh, from this point on, I am just going to be entering, you know, demonstration data. None of this is real. I'm really literally going to be making up numbers. I'm going to pick the very first jurisdiction on the list. Thank you, Adelanto, for being first alphabetically. Um, so as you go through this, just know none of this, the rest of this that I'm going to put in is real. It's all for demonstration purposes only. So the first step in a required field is to input a jurisdiction. 
If you don't input a jurisdiction, you would need to enter another area. This is because we have some special districts that provide waste collection services that may need to do this type of planning. Or maybe you're not working on a city. Maybe you want to do this for other reasons. I wouldn't know, but you'd have to put in at least a jurisdiction or something in the other area column. And next up, you would input your total population. Um, currently, you can, you know, you, there is a 2021 population data that was recently released by the Department of Finance. I believe it was a middle of May or so. So you can use that to put in your initial population. The projected population, uh, the Department of Finance does not provide that on an individual jurisdiction level. They only provide it at the county level. So you would use the best data you can find to estimate your population at the end of the planning period. And some suggestions might be uh, general plans, climate action plans, transportation studies, housing studies. Um, we, we don't have the information, we can't provide that. So we're, you know, for your planning purposes, we're hoping that you put in the best estimate you can get. So I'm just going to try to keep all these numbers nice and round. And as you can see, I've already filled in some things, 10,000 and projected population, 11,000. And the reason this projected population matters is because what we're trying to gauge is the change in disposal at that future planning, end of the future planning period. So to, for demonstration purposes, to keep this simple, just want it to be a 10% change. Um, be quite a feat if you do have a 10% uh, population increase in the next few years. But as I mentioned, for demonstration purposes, we're gonna try to keep this nice and round. <clears throat> So at that point, you would then press the search button and it will open up future steps in the calculator. Actually, I realize maybe I can zoom in a little bit for people and that might help. Sorry, should have thought of that right at the beginning. So after you press the search button, just know if you press, if you go through and enter any other data or you were to press the reset button, it will change the population data here which would then have a cascading effect on the rest of the calculations. So just know if you already go through it and then you press reset, you, know, you may lose a little bit of the data you'd already put in. Uh, you'll see an export to Excel button, which I mentioned earlier. You can't save any data in here, but you can export it. And the use defaults button, which I'm not gonna press quite yet, but I will be coming back to it in a minute because as I mentioned, we put in some uh, optional uh, things in here. And there's a few different ways to use the calculator, depending on uh, the level of detail you're going to be planning to. So this first field right here is where you would put in your disposal tons. And from there, it calculates a per, ca uh, a per capita disposal rate in pounds per person per day. Uh, like I said, I'm going to try to keep this nice and round. So 10,000 people and 10,000 tons and makes a 5.5 per capita rate. And what you will see below that is where you may put in any additional organic ADC or AIC that you may be using at this point that is um, required in the planning requirements. And also another field if you are currently disposing of any biosolids or digestate uh, in the landfill. These two fields are distinctly separate because as when we get in further into the calculations, uh, these items were not included in any of the waste characterizations that CalRecycle has conducted. So to not have them in as separate um, tons that are input, it would actually skew everything beyond that. So there's a reason these are separate. And if you don't have any, you can put a zero. If you do have some, as I mentioned for, pre for demonstration purposes, I'm just gonna put in some very small numbers here to keep it simple. And those will come in handy again later. So next up, we have some of the previous info we input in where that projected population is now being applied to the current per capita rate to give an adjusted disposal rate or adjusted disposal tons of 11,041. And now we get into where we're going to be able to make some more detailed calcs on organics itself and the different kinds of organics. So as you scroll down a little bit, you'll see a table with a list of all the waste characterization materials included in CalRecycle's past waste characterization. 
next to each one once again there's a tooltip explaining what that comes from and this is all sourced directly from the descriptions in the statewide waste characterization so one optional step you can do here and this is why i didn't press the use defaults button yet is that maybe you don't want to go to this level of granularity you do just want to make an overall estimate before you press that use defaults button these yellow lines can be edited individually and if you're really looking more into sort of ballpark figures for these different types you know if you don't press the button initially that's what will allow you to just kind of make a high level estimate but once you press the button it will carry over the detailed info from the statewide waste characterization into each of the fields. So as you'll notice, what I put in for total paper is a total, it's now gone. And what I put in under this total organics as a total is gone. It's been replaced by the sum of each of the individual material types below. Furthermore, in this section of the table, there is the ability to estimate maybe exactly how much of each material type is going to go to what type of primary facility as far as composting or community composting on-site organics management in vessel digestion etc and um, descriptions of each of those types of facilities are located further down below the table where next to each type it will show you uh, a hint or a reminder of what those types of facilities may entail furthermore if you do choose to say where each of these uh, material types may go and i'm only going to put in a few for demonstration purposes these aren't necessarily real uh options that would necessarily be used for these materials but every community and every jurisdiction is going to have different methods of moving the material and where they may go in the end so now that i've input a handful of facilities when i scroll down below what you'll see is that depending on the type of facility that was picked and if i were to pick you know multiple facilities what it will do down here is total the number of um tons as noted in the table above it'll give you a handy total down right down here next to each facility type furthermore if you choose to do that level of detail when we get into the next section where you can actually identify specific facilities where this material may be going it will give you a handy little reminder of oh i've got 572 tons of composting to move i should you know keep that in mind as i'm looking at my facilities and what capacity they may be able to accept from us So once again, what you will see here is another little total based on the waste characterization number above. And then we will get into step F where you can actually pick specific facilities. There are a couple of optional items on here. Once again, you have the ability to directly pull a facility record from the RDRS system, or you can put in a record without having that data pull. Um, this is done by pressing add new record and here in the county this is another optional feature we, we built in you're not limited to the county of the jurisdiction you select in step a you can pick a facility and have it load data from any county so i'm just going to pick that one because it was there as i said it and then the next step would be you can pick the site name I want to be clear that this is not specifically only pulling a composting facility in this composting section. It is a list of all facilities that report in the RDRS system. So while it might seem like, wow, you know, there's a metal recycler on here, that doesn't seem like a place that would handle compost. It's probably not. But, you know, we had to try to build in as much versatility as we could and also the way specific facilities may be coded in the system uh, in the, or in the RDRS system doesn't necessarily allow it to differentiate between composting or uh, in-vessel digestion or chip and grind. Some of those options are not always there in RDRS. So you have the ability to choose this type of facility, or you could come in, press new record, and type in whatever county you're going to do 
including misspelling. And you can enter any information you want in this in these fields, and you don't have to enter, none of this is required. And it allows you to either pick information fed directly from the CalRecycle system or enter whatever you may want down here, misspellings and all. Another big feature on this, on, you know, in this section of the calculator is to predict how many extra tons you're going to be sending to this facility. And it's not so much that, you know, you're already sending some information, some material there. This is all new disposal based on the waste characterization, which was looking at what's currently in the disposal stream and identifying what is organic and what would still need to be moved out of disposal. In this case, I'm saying that Atalanto will take a thousand tons through Napa County Waste and Recycling Services. And the next box is where you would check off whether you have verified capacity with the facility or it's unverified. In this case, we're gonna assume that they are still contracted to take at least another thousand tons of uh, material there. Let's say it's like, well, we know we can take a thousand, but we'd also like to do the same thing for this other unverified weight. So I will pick the same facility. You could pick the same facility on here as much and as often as you want. And in this case, I'm going to say we're verified to take a thousand, but I'm not going to check this box off because we'd like to take another thousand there. We just haven't contracted for it yet. And right down here, what you'll see is that estimate that I put in from the waste characterization shows here. And then right here, I'm saying we're going to, you know, we're predicting we're going to send 2,000 tons to this facility. So it's a nice little reminder if you're not meeting this 572, it's right in front of you right there, wondering, well, how much material is I going to take to composting? It'll tell you. I'm not going to go through each and every other facility type on here because you don't want to listen to me talk all day. I'm sure you're all eager to ask a lot of questions. So I am going to just scroll down through this just to give you an idea of all the different options and different facility types that are available. Uh, not all of these facility types necessarily have reporting in RDRS. So um, in some cases, a, a rendering company that might accept certain types of me. They're not necessarily going to be reporting an RDRS, so you'd most likely add that type as a new record, not an RDRS, as I demonstrate above, misspellings and all. So as we get through down to the bottom step, or <laughs> to last to bottom step, we have an additional uh, spot where if you have newer expanded facilities, this functions very much the same. But once again, since these are new, uh, you're not necessarily going to you know, have something that's already reporting. If it is a facility that exists and can be expanded, um, the compromise we had to make to make this functional was just to make it a data entry only field. So, uh, North Compost Posting, I'm just making up some information. None of these fields are required. Um, and we're going to spend, you know, we think they're going to be able to take an additional thousand tons from us. Or if you're anticipating for a closure, you could say, oh, this place where we are taking some material already is actually going to close and we know we're going to lose some space. So that would be in a way to address that type of change in um, available capacity. And then down here on the very last step, is where it will show uh, and you know whether you you know how much organics you will be taking in the future or how much you'll be generating in the future how much verified capacity you entered how much you may be short on that verified and then how much additional capacity you've identified and a potential shortfall or excess base related to that and once you have it complete you know, there's another just random note box if you need to jot something down but once complete You'd go in, hit the export to Excel button. Just waiting for it to pop up at the bottom of the page. Unless I'm using the wrong browser. There it is. And once 
You press that, it will give you a download of all the information you have input into the calculator. So with that, I would like to wrap up this part of the presentation. And before I do that, I would really like to thank our IT uh, team that worked on this, specifically uh, Luna Su, who could not be here with us today, but she was our project manager and kept this going along. Um, also, Isaac, Andrew, Evan, James, Kelly, thank you all for your repeated help. And there was a lot, a lot of work that went into this, especially to meet our web, our web page standards. And it was a, a really fun project to work with everyone on. And they really uh, made some minor data miracles happen to get this tool out. Uh, also, I'd like to thank a few other staff that contributed to this, uh, Janelle, uh, Jeff, who did extensive testing and helped write all the tool tips and instructions, um, Ashley, Kara, and Dan Brown for helping us get through some of the RDRS info. Um, a handful of other staff helped in the legal department in our statewide technical analytical resources group. And we all, I'd also like to thank our outside reviewers, um, LA County Department of Public Works and Tyla and Stephanie from San Diego, and most specifically Tracy Swanborn from HF and H Consultants, who provided a lot of really good feedback. Some of it was so good that while we would like to have incorporated some of it, you've already seen how complicated and long it is now to add some of the other bells and whistles that you know, we would have loved to have put in. It would make it even more complicated. So just as a reminder, this is for planning something in the future and you're really kind of ballparking it. Um, it's not meant to be exact down to the microton. You are really just trying to plan and estimate if you're gonna have enough space based on the reporting periods covered. So with that, I will wrap up my part of it and turn it back over for questions. Thank you so much, Chris. This is Julia here. I'm just going to bring up um, a couple last slides and then we will um, head right into the Q&A session. So I'm going to hand it over really quickly to the manager of our policy office, Dan Brown, for a quick informational item. Thank you, Julia. Um, so I just wanted to uh, chat about the uh, commercial generator-based edible food waste characterization study. It's, uh, again, uh, quite the mouthful. Um, I wanted to let you know that the study is currently underway. Uh, this study is going to help track progress towards established targets set, set forth by SB 1383 to achieve reductions in the level of the statewide disposal of organic waste with the special requirements for edible food waste reduction. Uh, our contractor Tetra Tech is beginning to recruit businesses and organizations in selected industry groups to participate in the study. Uh, and what those organizations have to do is fill out a survey on their food waste management practices and allow a field team to take a uh, 200 pound sample from both the trash and organics bin, as well as a peek inside the recycling bin to visually assess if there's any food waste or organic waste. Uh, the team will be sorting the samples into 11 material categories of which uh, eight are food categories and three non-food categories. Participating sites will receive a composition report of what their uh, trash and organic samples looks like, uh, theirs specifically. Uh, some of the industry groups we expect to be more difficult um, to recruit are listed in the slide. So that's the uh, recommendations desired for K through 12 schools, assisted living facilities, hospitals, performing arts, spectator sports and related industries, large venues and large events, and finally correctional facilities. Um, so, you know, we if you uh, have any recommendations on any of those groups or any other groups that you're aware of that, that we're sampling from that may be interested in participating and getting composition report for their organics and their trash bin, please let us know. Uh, and you can email us at wastecare at calrecycle.ca.gov. That's W-A-S-T-E-C-H-A-R at calrecycle.ca.gov uh, with suggestions or any questions. And that's it for me. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you so much, Dan. 
So this is Julia again. Um, just a quick reminder to please use the instructions shown on this slide if you'd like to ask a question during this question and answer session. If you're participating via the GoToWebinar platform, just type your question into the question pane. If you're watching the webinar via the broadcast, just email your question to the SLCP inbox. If you did receive a response in writing already to one of your questions in the GoToWebinar platform, I'm just going to remind you that we are still going to ask you to read off that question and we will repeat that answer out loud out loud over the webinar so that participants that are watching not in this platform can also hear that response. So with that, I will hand it over to Esmeralda to get us started. Thank you, Julia. Um, the first questions that we have are from Colleen Foster. Um, if you could go ahead and ask your question that was already answered um, in writing for those listening to the broadcast, and then go ahead and ask your other questions. Um, you are now unmuted on our end. Please unmute yourself and ask your questions. Yes, hi, this is Colleen Foster with the City of Oceanside. Um, I know you answered a couple of my questions. One of the questions that I didn't see an answer to is can you clarify the system times, you stayed in your presentation, the system times out every 120 minutes, but then the instructions say that you may lose information and may want to save every 15 minutes? Hi, Colleen. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a little. It's a little mealy mouth and confusing. Um, as I mentioned, we had to meet certain accessibility standards and to get some of those data tables that load information or you can change information in, uh, that's why it's kind of built like that. But what it really says is you have 120 minutes from when you start. And then after that 120 minute period, uh, if you stop using it for more than 15 minutes, that's when you may experience an issue. But in that first two hours, you can do whatever you want as frequently or infrequently as you want. It's after the two hours where you might have an issue. And okay, believe me, great. it's not ideal. <laughs> it was one of, as I mentioned, our IT team did a lot of work to try to get this to function correctly. Thank you, Chris. And then my other question before that was in regards to the interaction between the county and jurisdictions. So Cal Recycle requires jurisdictions to report on capacity. But then also Cal Recycle, you know, seeks to have counties to help organize that. But at the end of the day, jurisdictions are the responsible party. If there is some sort of issue between a jurisdiction and a county or a jurisdiction for whatever reason, there could be many different reasons, fails to report to the county, but effectively reports and meets all requirements to the state, would that be OK, essentially? The state's requirements are much clearer, but without some sort of documented guidelines and deadlines, you know, or strategy for counties across the state, it could be different across, you know, the board and hard to expect kind of what counties are going to expect from jurisdictions. Yeah, thanks, Colleen, for that question. Yeah, I expect in the scenario that you've presented, um, basically the county would be reporting that the particular jurisdiction um, did not provide the necessary data. Cal Recycle then would be interacting with that jurisdiction. Um, you know, I would expect that our, our first and primary objective would be to find out what happened. Where was there a breakdown? Was there an issue? Um, the, it is important that the county um, is able to consolidate that information. So if for some reason there was a breakdown and the jurisdiction specific data was available and for whatever reason didn't get rolled up into the county data, uh, we would work with both the county and the jurisdiction um, to address that particular situation. So, you know, I think we'll have to deal with each of those as they come up and then going forward, hopefully we can resolve that. And if we need to create, um, you know, more guidance on how to collaborate and, and whatnot, we are a little bit limited with the regulations because they don't get real specific on how that collaboration takes place. But I think as we move forward, we could develop some best management practices if they're necessary. Does that help, Colleen? That helps tremendously, Kara. And maybe it is a little bit of a recommendation if the state could develop some sort of best management practices or suggested timeline for counties, that would be fantastic. So today, I know all the deadlines that Cal Recycle is seeking, but what makes me 
nervous is that I don't know necessarily the timelines that our individual county may seek information. And it'd be great if we had consistency across the board. Yeah. Um, yeah, something for us to, we'll, we'll kind of assess um, this first one, you know, maybe a little bumpy, but as we go forward, we can assess what the needs are and um, if, if more is needed with any kind of best management practices, we can work on that. Thanks so much. Our next questions come from Mike Selling. Um, Mike, if you could unmute yourself, go ahead and state your name, affiliation, and your first question regarding insufficient organics waste. Once staff has given the opportunity to respond, you can go ahead and ask your second question. You're unmuted on our end to go ahead and unmute yourself. Okay, it looks like I'm good now. Yeah, we can hear you. Right. I see Chris nodding his head. Um, you know, Mike Selling, City of Galt. First question is, what if there's insufficient capacity for a given jurisdiction? Um, would they be eligible for an exemption or a waiver then, or how would that work? Hey, Mike, thanks for your question. Um, what I can tell you is, um, at this time, there is there is no waiver for for um, capacity or for a lack of capacity. There is. Uh, Way, there are waivers for low population and for high elevation, and um, we can we can dive into those uh, you know, during another time. But but at this time, there is no waivers for for capacity. And Kara could probably elaborate a little bit more on that. Yeah. Hey, Mike. Thanks for your question. So basically, what will happen is if an individual jurisdiction has not identified enough verified either existing new or expanded capacity. This will trigger that particular jurisdiction submitting an implementation schedule to CalRecycle. And um, in the, the chat, I, I put in what the details are, but basically it's going to be a plan. Um, that plan has to be submitted within 120 days after the county submits its report to CalRecycle. So you figure the county is gonna submit August 1. If, if a jurisdiction's in a situation where they've not identified they're verified, um, again, existing, new, or planned. So it doesn't have to be capacity that's already online, expanded, sorry, online. It can be capacity that's coming online. But if you have no idea where your additional capacity is coming from, that's what's going to trigger an implementation schedule. And that schedule is basically a plan. How are you going to fund the, the additional capacity? What are the steps that the jurisdiction is going to take to secure that additional capacity? Does that help address the question, Mike? Not really, because uh, you know, if, if we don't know where our stuff is going or how far, that was kind of my second part was, is there a reasonable distance? I mean, if, if you're basically saying a given jurisdiction might have to have it sent 200 miles away, at some point it gets to be you know, just too expensive basically. Um, so that's kind of where I'm going. Is there something that's gonna be deemed reasonable? Yeah, yeah, that's a really good point. And, you know, the regulations don't uh, specifically address that. You know, I think, uh, you know, we'll have to work with individual jurisdictions um, that are in that situation. Um, so the way the regulations are set up is as a part of that implementation schedule, if a jurisdiction um, is in a situation needing to um, secure additional capacity. So Mike, that could be you know, working with a particular facility, working with a, a number of jurisdictions. For example, in Sacramento County, a number of the jurisdictions are working on identifying future capacity. So um, in that case, if CalRecycle determined it was necessary, a jurisdiction could, through the enforcement process, be put on what's called a corrective action plan. And that can be up to a total of three years of time um, to work on that capacity. But again, you know, it's a little bit hard, Mike, speaking in just kind of general scenarios, but there are jurisdictions who right now are sending their organics um, quite a distance, some, some are, some are not having to do that. So there's quite a, a variation around the state. Hopefully, as, as more facilities come online, as more capacity also comes online, as jurisdictions work with industry to develop that capacity, and hopefully if more funding comes uh, to help with that, we'll see more facilities. So um, does that help, Mike? I mean, it, it obviously it doesn't 
uh, address yeah. the the, I, the I, uh, distances. Yeah, no, thanks, Kara. But I, I think, you know, what I'm really kind of, I guess, getting at is we all understand there aren't enough facilities permitted or even in process, you know, to handle the amount of waste that we're talking about here, the amount of organics. And so that's what I'm looking at is, is basic, the basic question is, is Cal Recycle going to recognize that and, you know, and, and take that into consideration, I guess, you know, for jurisdictions as we try to navigate this totally new deal so yeah 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 i mean all all important and good points and certainly we are going to recognize that but we're going to be looking to jurisdictions you know we have jurisdictions for example that are going out with requests for proposals um some jurisdictions have worked with uh you know industry to submit a grant you know to, to build a facility so you know it, it's it there's going to be a variety of approaches some jurisdictions are uh, you know, uh, putting on their haulers, right, to identify that capacity. So there's a, quite a variety around the state. Certainly Cal Recycle is, is working um, on this issue. And as and if we get um, any additional funding, uh, particularly for organics capacity development, that's going to be important to building the infrastructure. So, you know, I think um, there's, there's certainly not a uh, particular answer. There is, um, based upon um, the water board's analysis of uh, wastewater treatment uh, facility capacity, there is uh, capacity available with wastewater treatment plants. So we are, uh, I think, expecting to see more of those types of facilities expand their capacity. Um, so I, I think we're going to see a lot happening in this area, Mike, over the next, you know, couple of years. Yeah, no, I agree. I think it's going to take at least a couple of years, yeah. but uh, yeah. appreciate that. I think it's, yeah, there's a long way to go on this and hopefully the state's going to be helping a lot because they're the ones who put these, you know, legislation in place. So. Yeah, absolutely. And I, I really encourage you to, to follow, you know, the budget conversations uh, because both the governor's budget and um, the, uh, the legislature is proposing funding both for jurisdictions as well as for infrastructure capacity. So really encourage jurisdictions to follow that conversation and reach out to your legislators because this is the time to be uh, reaching out to them about the needs that you have in, in this arena. Thanks, Mike. Great, thanks, Kara. Thank you. The next couple of questions are coming from Kelly Shoemaker. Um, you are now unmuted on our end. If you could please state your affiliation, um, well, unmute yourself, state your affiliation, and ask your questions. Okay. Hi. Can you all hear me? Okay, okay. Great. So I had a question about the one is sort of a nuts and bolts question, and um, I'm wondering if when we get final 2021 um, population numbers, if they'll be pre-populated into the calculator, kind of similar to the 8876 calculator, just to take you know, you know, just be a little faster. That's all. Uh, we would hope so. Um, obviously, <laughs> we don't have 2021 disposal yet, and the final 2021 population won't be there till next year. But that is uh, part of the idea and how it was constructed. And and one major difference between the 876 calculator and reporting and this one is that 876 required each year in the annual report plan out for another 15 whereas this one is not is much different it's not actually going to be annual reporting and when you're doing the reporting we're going to try to provide the best available data for it so we're hoping it can load in at least disposal and population but as i mentioned we're never going to have our own you know verifiable projected population so that most likely will always be on the user to input on their own okay all right thanks for clarifying that um and so well one question i didn't sneak in there but it does sound like we'll be doing both ab 876 and 1383 organic capacity reporting or is this superseding that um well in the annual oh, report sorry. that is due this year you will still be doing 876 capacity planning because this is not <laughs> 1383 right. stuff is next year um kara you can you can clarify that a little bit more yeah, Kelly, our plan is that starting with next year's annual report, um, with the counties reporting August 1, 2022, it will be utilizing this new calculator tool. 
And <laughs> 876, what, the way we built it, it's that uh, the five material types that you're planning for and the planning periods are rolled into that calculator. So you won't have to do both. Yay. Okay, that's great news. Mm -hmm. um, that wasn't really my second question, though. Can I ask my real second question? Sure. <laughs> Sorry. That's um, right. <laughs> so my other question is the uh, if you could all if you all could elaborate on what constitutes um, verifiably available capacity um, and what what you need to what what is expected of jurisdictions to supply in that way. Chris, do you want to start or do you want me to? Well. I'm going to read the tooltip that we have yeah, included in you. the calculator because <laughs> checking the box indicates the jurisdiction is verified, uh, the facilities remain capacity is available to them as the jurisdiction prior to the end of the reporting period. Uh, it should not be confused for the total capacity of the facility. This is what you have either a written, agree a written agreement of some type saying, yes, you can use the space and your jurisdiction will be able to bring X number of tons here. Um, the regulation state a county can demonstrate the capacity is verifiably available to the county or its jurisdictions through a contract, franchise, or other documentation of existing new or extended capacity at a facility, activity, operation, or property that recovers organic waste that will be available to the county or its jurisdiction prior to the end of the reporting period. Right. So the, the other documentation, I guess that's where my, that's where to me the big gray area is, is an email okay from saying yep. we say that there's there's this much because what if they don't have like a tonnage but they have a different type of requirement um, yeah you know, kelly i mean there's there's we built in a lot of flexibility I, the key yeah. is is that you have some documentation that that you've got secured capacity and and obviously with the the various types of activities that that capacity could go to right uh for example a renderer Right. You may just have an email that says, you know, X amount of tons is going to go to this renderer. So lots of uh, there can be lots of variations. The key is that it's um, not a uh, wishing capacity, right, that you've actually right. determined. And it could be, you know, your hauler has uh, some type of agreement uh, with a particular facility. So I think we'll see lots of variations. There's flexibility, but there does need to be something um, to assure you as the jurisdiction will not you know, stop waste, but you know, a jurisdiction um, has um, that capacity available to them. Okay, uh, thanks. Thanks for the questions. Thank you. Now our next question will be coming from the SLCP inbox. This was sent from Sadie Caldez with um, Placer County Public Works. The question is, can the agreements to verify existing capacity be between the haulers and the facility, or do they need to be between the jurisdiction and the facility? Yeah, they can They can certainly be between the hauler and the facility. Uh, the only caveat there is the jurisdiction would, you know, need to know that that hauler and facility have some type of agreement. So to connect the dots. Thank you, Kara. The next question from the inbox is from Anna Kramer with Imperial Western Products Incorporated. They ask, for this waste characterization study, why is animal feed not being taken into consideration? It was considered in 2018 and there is still a lack of capacity. Um, Chris, I mean, you showed rendering as one of the options and animal feed, uh, you know, could be an option. I'm, I'm not sure where the confusion is on that. I'm squinting a little bit too because animal feed's not, that you're right, it's not in the waste characterization. We're not characterizing animal feed. If, are you, if you're asking whether it's an option as a facility type, yes, animal feed is most definitely on the list. As I mentioned, I would put in a handful of facilities there, but if there, there's there's at least 12 or 13 different types of facilities and options that you could pick in the calculator, and animal feed is one of them. I yeah. don't, if you're asking if why we're not characterizing the animal feed, I don't think we want to know what's in that. 
Well, and besides that, we don't consider that disposal. So when we do characterization, we're looking at what's in yeah. the disposed stream. So let us know if that answered your question. Um, but certainly animal feed is, is a great option uh, for some of our organic waste to, to move down that path. So we definitely uh, want to encourage that. And that is one of the options, as Chris said, in the calculator tool. Thank you. The next question we have is from Anika Anderson. Um, I believe you are now unmuted. If you can go ahead and ask your question. Hi, can you hear me? Okay, <laughs> I didn't get a response. Okay, my question is, um, since this is a really difficult training to follow along with when you can't actually do the calculator tool, is it possible for there to be a kind of more in-depth training between Cal Recycle and city staff? And then um, is it possible for there also to be an SOP um, so you can kind of follow along if you aren't able to watch a training after the fact or you know participate um, in a, a more uh, detailed training? Sure. So yeah, feel free um, if you if you want to reach out to Jeffrey McDaniel, um, he can walk you through it, set up a special meeting, et cetera. Jeffrey is going to be our point on responding to questions and providing any follow up. So if you wanted to set up a a one on one or with city staff, um, et cetera, feel free to reach out. And okay. I will. And add, would there? Uh, I just ahead. wanted to say. Um, I realize it is a lot to go over. I mean, I, if you I, I could sit here for hours <laughs> pointing out so many things on it. Uh, so there were two considerations here. One, it was a webinar. We didn't want me to just talk the whole time. Also, <laughs> I may have been going a little fast. I saw that comment. I'm sorry. You know, a little nervous. This was, this was a lot of work. This was months and months of work between a lot of people. And this is like our grand rollout. So part of it is nervousness. Part of it is excitement. But, you know, it's it's a really awesome tool once you kind of get into some of the nooks and crannies and what it can do for you. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. I just wanted to see if it's possible to have a like a kind of an SAP document to guide you through once you actually sit down and do your report. Because this is great for now, but you know, once we actually do our our annual reports, we'll, we'll have forgotten all about um, this training. So, and I I don't know what SOP stands for. Standard oh, I'm sorry. Operating. Standard operating procedure. <laughs> Ah, got it, got it, got it, yeah. And, and one thing we tried to do, and I pointed out the tool tips and some of the more verbose instructions on the screen, mm -hmm. a lot of the, the walk you through documentation, how do I use it, what do I do, we tried to build into the tool itself. Right. So I think when, once you maybe get into it, use it a little bit and actually you know, read some of the instructions, uh, it'll be a little bit more clear as well. Okay, great, thank you. Thank you. Next up is a question from Stephanie Ewalt. Hope I pronounced that correctly. You are now unmuted. Please state your name, affiliation, and ask your question. You're unmuted. Hi. Hi, this is Stephanie from the County of San Diego. Can you guys hear me? Hi, Chris. Hi, Kara. Thank you, guys. Hi, the Stephanie. tool looks amazing. And um, I had a question about kind of the county's role in this tool. I know for AB, 876 uh, mm -hmm. we can kind of see everybody's data like the totals um, so in some of the defaults it'll total uh, default and show the totals for the whole county um, mm -hmm. is there going to be a way for the county to see other jurisdictions data or um, as they enter it, or is this totally two separate things? Or will they be, like when they enter their data into the organics planning capacity calculator, will that just be going straight to Cal Recycle? Will that, will no. that no. at all be looped you're, back in? Yeah, no, the county needs to, make, maybe this gets to Colleen's earlier point, the county needs to establish um, whatever the process is gonna be for the individual jurisdictions to provide the necessary data to the county because the county is then going to roll it up into that that larger number and that's what the county is going to submit in its uh, report that's due this first one that's due august 1. so um you know some counties are setting up an electronic portal system so uh, jurisdictions can submit their data some are just having the jurisdictions email 
um, their totals to them. The county is not responsible for doing quality control of the individual jurisdictions um, capacity planning, but we do hope that as a group, as a region that you work together because um, some of that capacity, right, um, uh, is, you know, you don't want to have multiple people asking the same facility for the data, that kind of stuff. So there's a lot of opportunity for coordination. Also, the county should establish a timeline and communicate that out to the jurisdictions. And we think it's a really good idea for counties to set up regular meetings with the jurisdictions as touch bases, um, see how everything's going making sure everyone's uh, moving along um, as they need to. But again, um, the the specific, all of this data that's in this calculator tool will be kept and maintained by the individual jurisdictions. Um, the county will be provided those various pieces of data that they will roll up into their um, their final report. And that, that data is laid out in the um, Article 13 uh, section of the end report. Did that help answer the question, Stephanie? Yeah, thanks, Carrie. Yes, and I and I do. Yeah, I do know the role of the county. I fully understand um, that, and we do have some timelines um, set up okay. for yeah. cities uh, uh -huh. to answer Colleen's question. Yeah, um, we do have we do have uh, that available. We're just. Um, we're, we're waiting on a few additional pieces as we, I mean, it's still, we've got six months, so I'm still kind yeah. of um, working on that, but that mm -hmm. is coming, Colleen, so the due date's to us, but yeah. I guess what I was just kind of trying to put together is um, in the tool itself, I mean, all that data is being inputted already uh, by the jurisdictions, so is there any way that, I mean, is it, is the idea that, hey, uh, Carlsbad will just print out that PDF and then send mm -hmm. it to the county. Is there any other streamlined way for us, the county, to get that information? Like, I just yeah, don't want to have to be re entering it into sure. a spreadsheet or something yeah. else, you know? Yeah, so totally, I was just wondering if, yeah. It, yeah. We totally appreciate that. And we were not able to develop, you know, like a portal system where everyone could roll in their data and then it would get rolled up. So, uh, you know, I, um, I do appreciate your comment. Um, this was the what what we could put together with our resources and again it's um you know setting it up so that the county's provided that specific data that's requested in article 13 and you're rolling that up into totals and submitting that to cow recycle in your report so sorry we don't have anything fancier than that but we don't no it's great it is fancy i know you guys worked really hard so thank you i was just wondering that yeah the logistics on the back end yeah but there's so much there's so much planning tool potential in that calculator and like 85 percent of what's in there is not anything we can require to be reported so that that was one of the you know things we had to work around where yeah we would have loved it if we could have built a portal where this feeds in and it's saved and we have access to it we could do cool yeah. map to figure out what's oversubscribed but the regulations don't call for that level of detail to be reported to us so we, we had I did. I did have one little back. piece of additional, a little additional question about the RDRS data. Is that populated in each of the jurisdictions' um, calculator? No, is there like I, to, no? Okay, I, that's just something that they'll have to put in manually. Yeah, because it's not like if you uh, are, if you're a jurisdiction in Alameda County, it's not going to limit you to only the facilities in Alameda County because things move around. You know, depend. Maybe you're closer to a border and things might go to Solano. So it's not it's not limiting in that sense. You get to pick the county of the facility location and it will load some preliminary data for you, but we didn't want to isolate it to say, well, these cities in this county, that's all they have access to because that's not how it works in, in reality. Like things go across borders all the time and we didn't want it to necessarily be too limiting in that sense. But at the same time, once you pick your, you know, you can pick any county you want, and it also will show all the facilities in that county. So when you're picking an actual facility or site, you know, make sure you're you're getting the right one because some some rep there's multiple um, reporting entities from the same company, and you will see that it's like, why is this one listed three times? It's because they have three different reporting elements that feed into RDRS. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you. The next question we have is coming from James Dunbar. You are now 
unmuted, please unmute yourself, state your affiliation, and ask your question. Okay, I'm not sure if they can unmute themselves, but I will ask the question. The question is, how often is the capacity to be verified to meet the regulations? Hey James, thank you so much for the question. So the regulations don't specify um, a time period. So um, you know, at a minimum, um, the verification needs to happen during the capacity planning period. So for example, right now we're planning for, you know, the gearing up so that the county can submit its report in August, 2022. And then two years later is the next one. And then after that, it's a rolling period. So at a minimum then, um, you know, with that said, um, it's important that jurisdictions are continuing to uh, determine their capacity, even though they're not required to report it to Cal Recycle. But that's really up to you. and and what you determine um, some jurisdictions have you know the majority of their capacity um, their organic waste going to one facility for example so it's a lot easier for them so it's kind of all over the board so i hope that answered your question if not let us know okay next question is from david briggs david you are now unmuted please unmute yourself state your name relation and ask your Um, I'll go ahead and ask the question on David's behalf. The question is, what is the current estimated date when jurisdictions will be able to apply for population waivers? I don't know if you can see the it's the USDA reserve. Yeah. Hey, um, David, thanks for the question. Um, I'm glad you're here today. So our plan is um, to start accepting waiver requests in September. The last thing we're waiting for right now is the US Census track data. As soon as that data has been released, um, you, you saw Dan Brown earlier, Dan's team is going to be um, posting all of the census tracks that meet the low population threshold, as well as the individual uh, jurisdictions, cities, for example, all of the jurisdictions that meet the rural exemption and all of the elevation, um, either census tract waived areas or jurisdiction waived areas. So we plan to put that up. We're currently in process of developing the waiver web page, uh, should be up later this month. We also um, are close to finishing the forms uh, that jurisdictions can submit. So you'll see what, what needs to be submitted with the form in September. As soon as that census data is available, census tract data is available, we're gonna get that pulled together. And within a few weeks of that, hold a webinar to take jurisdictions through the waiver training, tell you uh, about the forms, what needs to be submitted, where the data is on the website um, and whatnot. Um, we will be, uh, we do have a process where we'll be posting on our website those uh, jurisdictions that have approved waivers. Um, and again, um, uh, anytime after September, jurisdictions can start submitting. But I think one thing I want to point out and call out with respect to the waivers is if you meet uh, one of those thresholds for the waiver, um, Cal Recycle um, doesn't have discretion not to approve it. So, you know, it, it's a little, you know, if there's, uh, if you have your, say, if you're a city and you have your low population data, uh, right now, you may already know whether you're eligible or not. And certainly as soon as that census tract data is available, you'll know uh, which census tracts are available as well. So just keep that in mind that you don't necessarily, while there is a formal process where you'll have to submit to Cowrie Cycle, you'll know as soon as you have the data whether or not you're eligible and will be uh, approved for the waiver. So I hope that's helpful, Dave. If it's not, let us know. Next question is from Neil Shapiro. You are unmuted on our end. Please unmute yourself, state your affiliation, and ask your question. Hi, how's everyone doing? Uh, Neil Shapiro, City Santa Monica. Just to follow up on Mike's question, and Car, thank you for responding to him. Maybe just yeah. to make it clear, obviously, if there's not enough capacity, and certainly in Southern California, it seems like 
there isn't presently, although I just emailed our vendor to ask him. Um, mm -hmm. But given it could take three to five years to build more capacity, because that just, you know, environmental concerns and reports is, will Cal Recycle allow in our implementation timeline to give us that much time? Yeah, um, Neil, that's a great question. Um, you know, I can tell you what the regulations um, provide for, which is if Cal Recycle determined that enforcement action was necessary, the regulations allow for up to three years when there's an infrastructure need. So again, keep in mind that that, that timeline would be when and if Cal Recycle took an enforcement action, that timeline applies. Cal Recycle does have discretion as to when it takes enforcement and starts that that uh, specified clock. So, um, uh, you know, Cal Recycle again is going to work with jurisdictions. We're really looking for what you are doing um, to secure that capacity. You know, jurisdictions that are, um, you know, going out with requests for approvals, um, or RFP proposals. Excuse me. Um, or working with their hauler, um, you know, just uh, being really in process of identifying where that capacity is going to come from. Um, I think, you know, we're looking for jurisdictions to be making that that substantial effort. Um, that could include, uh, you know, funding, whether that's applying for a grant or, uh, you know, starting to get the funding through um, uh, your rate setting, et cetera. So I hope that's helpful, Neil. Did that help answer kind of the question? Um, yeah, but again, as I said, it could take three to five years. So I guess the point is if we show we're following all the points you made, we're looking for funding, we're talking to our, our mm -hmm. facility and showing good faith, but it still sounds like there's a maximum of three years um, at, some, at some deadline. And let's say you still need more time after that and you've shown good faith. Yeah, yeah. And again, just going back to... Um, as the regulations are written, that corrective action plan is for a specified time. So where Cal Recycle's discretion comes into play is when we would trigger an enforcement action. So, um, you know, it would be a determination by Cal Recycle if we were to um, trigger that enforcement action. So, I, you know, I can't um, go beyond what's in the regulations, Neil, as far as kind of clarifying that. But again, it's when our discretion is to, if we determined that an enforcement action was necessary, then right. that timeline comes into play. And oh. all of that beforehand is, you know, the Cal Recycle conducting a compliance evaluation, that takes time, et cetera. So, you know, again, Cal Recycle wants to work with jurisdictions. And as you mentioned, you know, jurisdictions that are moving down the path to complying doing what's needed, um, identifying, you know, where they're going to get that capacity, although it may take time, Cal Recycle does have um, enforcement discretion. Oh, okay, so I get me, I was confused. So the three-year enforcement, that could happen after two or three years where we're showing you we're working to get the capacity, let's say. So it could be, it could be, that could be five years. If we work two or three years to get the capacity and it's going to be built, it's taking a little longer. So it sounds like there is some flexibility and enough time to make it happen within a reasonable amount of time, basically. So. Yeah. Again, uh, you know, I just have to be a little bit careful here because um, right. I need to kind of, you know, stay within race. But, you know, I think the point is when Cal Recycle did conduct that compliance evaluation, I don't know how much time that will be to when Cal Recycle would, would do that, say of your city, for example. And then, you know, when it, when Cal Recycle determines that an enforcement action would be, then that clock starts. So right, okay. I hope that okay. helps. Um, yeah. I'm, I am hedging around a little bit just to stay no, with the okay. language. Got it, thank you much, appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks for all you're doing in Santa Monica. Now we'll take it to Trishena Robinson with Los Angeles County Public Works. You are now unmuted on our end. Please restate your name and the question. You are unmuted. I see the icon is on 
for your mic, but I'll go ahead and ask it and you can feel free to jump in. Um, let's see. Is it the county's responsibility to confirm if the capacity is verifi ver quote, verifiably available to the jurisdiction? Or is the county simply collecting the data, consolidating it, and resubmitting it to CalRecycle on behalf of the jurisdiction? Yeah, thanks so much for that question. So in general, it's the latter. The county is responsible for collecting the data from the jurisdictions, consolidating and rolling it up. The only caveat I wanted to add is that for the county's own capacity, it is your responsibility to uh, verify the capacity that's for unincorporated county. So just wanted to throw that little caveat in there. Let us know if that, if you had any more follow-ups. The next question we have is coming from David Briggs. We're unmuted on our end, and I believe your mic is now on, so you can uh, go ahead and ask your question and please state your affiliation. Hi, um, this is Dave Briggs and I'm with the County of Napa. Hi, Dave. Um, hi, Cara. Uh, nice to see you and great answers. Nice to if, see you too. Yeah, if a jurisdiction is lacking capacity for a particular type of organics processing facility, mm -hmm. but not another, will a jurisdiction need to address in its implementation plan only the type of organics facility it's lacking? Mm -hmm. Or does that plan yeah, need to be much exactly more comprehensive? It. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah, exactly, Dave. So you might have um, capacity for most um, of the material types that are required for capacity planning, but maybe there's one material type that um, you don't have capacity yet for. Um, and so that is what would potentially trigger an implementation schedule if you don't know where that capacity is going to come from. So um, I think in your example, maybe uh, wood chips or... Um, uh, yeah, yeah lack of capacity for wood chips. Yeah. So that would be an example where um, if that's all of the jurisdictions in the county um, don't have a place to send the, the wood chips or the material that's processed from composting those overs, for example, then that could trigger all of the jurisdictions having to submit an implementation schedule and, and you know, potentially working as a, a you know, in a countywide group. Um, to, to really come up with a solution for, for wood chips. That's great. Okay, thanks for the answer. Yeah, you're welcome. Okay, now we'll go back to Callie Schoonmaker. Um, please ask your question. You are now unmuted on our end. This question is regarding outreach. Okay, thanks, Ray. Um, let's see, I gotta find it because I had asked <laughs> and then it kind I kind of lost it. But okay, it's about outreach and who what entity is sort of um obligated to um do the outreach in a community. So let's say a, a jurisdiction's franchised hauler is expanding a facility in a county different from that jurisdiction, who's responsible for the outreach? Is it the jurisdiction sending the organics to the expanded facility, um, the hauler or the operator? Is it the county where the facility is located? Or is it the county where the jurisdiction sending the organics is located? Or is it all the jurisdictions that will be served by this expanded capacity? So thinking of an example like Recology, Blossom Valley North serves many jurisdictions in multiple counties. Mm -hmm. Like they're all benefit from the expanded capacity. So <laughs> I was just wondering, how yeah. how do you do the outreach for that? Yeah, okay. so um, it it is the the host jurisdiction that needs to conduct that community outreach, and the intention is because that's where the most of the impact is going to be is where that facility is located. So it would be that that host jurisdiction that would need to conduct the specified community outreach that's laid out in the regulations in Article Eleven. Even if yeah and. If that's going to be interesting if they're not sending organics there, I guess. But. Yeah, yeah, because we you could have, yeah, you could have a host jurisdiction that's not even using that facility for sure. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Thank you yeah. for clarifying. Yeah, sure, Kelly. And you know, certainly if we have that kind of situation, you know, definitely we would want that jurisdiction to reach out to Cal Recycle, um, see how we can assist. Um, but uh, you know, appreciate that that they could have a, a facility in their jurisdiction that they're not actually using. But they're the ones that know their community. They know the um, 
the, yeah. uh, the folks that are impacted and that's why we expect them to do the community outreach. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Next, we wanted to say thank you to Avneet for your comment and we will go to Ann Schneider with the next question. You are now unmuted. Please unmute yourself and ask your question. Hate mute buttons. Good afternoon. Thank you for this. I'm an elected official who sort of works in the recycling field. Great to see both calculators, but getting it down to small jurisdictions can be difficult. Also, I'm working on a project trying to bring in the chamber. Have you guys thought about how to bring the commu business community into this so that they understand what local government has to do? Yeah, and thank you so much. Um, appreciate your leadership on the statewide commission as well. Um, thank you. Yeah, we, we have engaged um, and continue to engage with the statewide associations. Um, Ashley, if you're on, you want to uh, speak to this a little bit more, but We've been working with a number of um, the business associations. We've actually even been making some presentations um, to some chambers, for example. So again, um, if, and if there's any that you feel that we need to reach out to, please feel free to send that to the SLCP inbox. Ashley, do you wanna add anything on our collaboration with various business groups? Yeah, I was just gonna say what you said, Kara, is, and if you have any recommendations, we're always happy to get them. Um, we're always trying to get 13A3 out there. So for the people who are asking us to do presentations, we're always happy to do them, um, even if it's just for like a small little community. So if you have any other suggestions, let us know. We're really, um, for the past few years, we were targeting the bigger um, associations and chambers and whatnot. But if there are some smaller ones who really don't even know what 1383 is, we're happy to chat with them. So Anne, feel free to reach out. Um, to the SLCP inbox, or you can reach out directly to me if you'd like. Excellent. I, I will tell you that small chambers with COVID have had a heck of a time. Our chamber has been active for a city of 23,000, but we're predominantly restaurants and food places. So this is perfect for us, but many chambers have not survived. Uh, but I will do my best and would love to have you come on down. We'll probably try to gather some of the other chambers so that you can meet with all of us, but lovely. Sure. Perfect, thanks, Ann. Now going back to Colleen Foster. Colleen, if you could unmute yourself, remind everyone your affiliation, and ask your question regarding capacity planning and double counting. You are now. Hi, Colleen Foster, Environmental Officer, City of Oceanside. Um, I, I, I gotta go back to a comment you made, Kara, and, and thank you so much for bearing through all our questions here. It's greatly appreciated. But you mentioned wish capacity and you mentioned Cal Recycle not wanting us to do wish capacity, having some sort of guarantee. But the reality is, is, you know, I mean, the regulation we acknowledge it still requires over another hundred facilities and one billion in infrastructure. So there are going to be jurisdictions essentially today that don't know where their materials are going to go. So is there like a box in the tool that says, you know, I don't know? Or do we really have to try to like, I don't know, guess capacity, kind of wish capacity, state, yeah. okay, there are seven facilities in our region yeah. that can take these materials, but I have no guarantee or commitments to either of those, so I have yeah. to list the seven facilities. Yeah, the way Chris built the calculator tool, and I'll let him speak to it, is exactly that. So it allows you to identify that capacity that's existing, planned, or expanded, right? And the planned, uh, or new and expanded, excuse me, the new and expanded capacity may not be online yet, but but that's that's secured. Like, you know, you're, you may have your, your hauler, they may own the facility, they're building it or expanding, et cetera. That's capacity that you verify that you have available. The calculator then has a section um, for the capacity that you don't have yet. Uh, you know, we call it unverified capacity, um, but it's the capacity that you, you don't know where it's gonna come from yet. The calculator tool also has a section where it identifies capacity that you haven't verified, but you have an idea. Like this is capacity that we're gonna explore. And so while it's not verified, that allows you in your calculator tool to list that capacity. It's kind of like your to-do list of going after and trying to see if you can secure that. So Chris, do you wanna to add to that? 
And then also just Chris, if you can also add to how to avoid double counting, because there could be a facility in the area, even in my own jurisdiction, that can say it can accept up to you know 300 tons, but they could be doing that for you know a multitude of jurisdictions or customers throughout the county. So I don't know if those are my 300 tons or not. So Kara kind of gave a, a really good kind of overview of how to account for what's verified and what's not. And I guess I will share my screen again really quick because I still have it up. Uh, what do I need to do? Share. I guess I can't because I'm not a presenter. Um, anyway, in, when when I was going through those individual facility pickers where you can pick a, a facility that's in RDRS, one that's not in RDRS, you had that toggle checkbox to say verifiable or in the verifiable column true and verifiable false. The true is what you know you have available to you through contractor or, or other written means, email, you know, however that you're going to verify that. The if you if you don't check the box you can still enter a facility and enter tons and that's more the, the 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 wish space like look we're already taking some stuff here but we're going to need to take more but we haven't verified it yet so you can you can kind of account for the stuff that's verified and then start picking off facilities that that are not verified and you don't check that box and one of the at the end one of the major calculations is based on the amount of organics that's estimated to be generated and your verified capacity here's how much space you have to get then the next line below that will show here's kind of your wish capacity the unverified information that you put in and then after that the very final number is that essentially here's the tons that you have no plan for whatsoever like not you did not not verified not unverified you're going to generate 5,000 tons and you've only put in 2,500 that final number will also be your short 2,500. So ideally you want that very final number on the calculator to be zero. Uh, to address your second question about double counting, uh, there's not really anything we can do. Uh, this is a tool that was built to be used by jurisdictions. And I've been asked early on, you know, what keeps a jurisdiction from just putting in whatever they want and lying in it? It's like, absolutely nothing. It's, it's a tool, it's versatile, you can use it for whatever you want. Now, perhaps if the county, when they're looking at this, at what they're given from the jurisdiction, it's like, hey, you know, we got seven cities here and six of them all said they're gonna spend an additional 30,000 tons to facility X. That'd probably be something the county could address, you know, with the jurisdictions like, hey, you guys all pick the same spot and your tons are gonna add up to more than that place can handle. You might need to, um, you know, reconsider your planning a little bit. And, and there's nothing that we can do on our end regarding that calculator tool to prevent that. It, it's open, it's not saved. And, you know, if, if a jurisdiction chose to, they could send us the, their Excel export to detail it, but there's no requirement for that. And, you know, one way a county could do it is say, we'd like each of you to use this tool to do these estimates because it'll be simpler for us to be able to look at it and get it all in the same format. But on, on our level, we're not going to necessarily be told this exact facility, this exact amount of tons from this jurisdiction. That's not uh, in the reporting requirements. Okay, thank you for that clarification. I mean, I feel for my peer, Stephanie at the county, because, you know, is she going to have to try to reconcile these jurisdictions? And it's not a matter of a jurisdiction line. It's a matter of the fact that, you know, much of this infrastructure is not committed yet. And there are, you know, hundreds of cities not ready. So we're we're all in that realm of unknowns and wish capacity planning. And then also the haulers. It's, it's really what are they telling us and what is reality, um, you know, without contracts. So I think that's the complication. And then lastly, if... It, when we submit these reports and the, this information and cities are found to not have capacity so that number is not zero like you mentioned chris that number is no capacity for these types of material material streams up to this tonnage does that automatically trigger the requirement by cal recycle for an implementation schedule because I, I i recall you kara mentioning a trigger for an implementation schedule is that triggered at the city submitting their information or at the county's reconciliation of all the information received? So 
So Colleen, it's a, it's a little bit of both per se. Um, the both part I mean is that when a jurisdiction does its calculations and, and knows that it has that gap, uh, it, you know, it has capacity that it, it doesn't have a place for material to go, right? It knows that. Um, that's a known factor. However, the, the timeline for the jurisdiction to submit an implementation schedule does not start until, until when the county submits its report to CalRecycle. The county will inform each jurisdiction that has to submit an implementation schedule, okay, your 120-day clock has, has started. And, and then it's it's on that jurisdiction to submit the schedule um, to CalRecycle. I don't know yet if we'll have um, any guidance or templates for the implementation schedule. It's a little too early. We haven't uh, begun even really talking about that piece. But I do think, you know, again, in this, uh, like everything, in this first capacity planning period, in this first year of implementation or first two years of implementation right you know all of the jurisdictions are working hard scrambling is a good word um you know just working hard to have programs in place and so you know cow recycle is really looking to um you know our jurisdictions moving down that path to complying with the requirements um you know focusing on those priority areas making that effort and um, and again, you know, we would be looking at the implementation schedule as the jurisdiction identifying that they have a gap and that they need um, to plan for that and and work through that that additional capacity need. Does that help answer the question, Colleen? Yes, thank you. Yeah, you bet. Thank you. Good questions. The next question we have got cut off um, in the question pane, but it is coming from David Eisen. You are now unmuted. If you can go ahead and unmute yourself and then ask your question. Hi, um, this is Dave from Imperial Western Products. Appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you for all your hard work and we really, really appreciate helping out in any manner possible. So. Um, the waste characterization study, we haven't played with it yet, so I apologize if I don't ask it appropriately. Um, is the animal feed not being taken into consideration? And uh, I, I think you've already answered it. Sorry. I think we're all good there. Sorry. Yep, you're right. Awesome. Hey, Dave, no, thanks for, for raising it. And I'm glad you raised it because, you know, animal feed is going to be an important option. Uh, for moving organic waste um, too. So I'm glad you called it out. Um, it is part of the calculator tool and hopefully a part of jurisdictions planning to the degree that it's an option for them. So thanks so much. Yeah, there and there is, you know, there, there are various types of materials listed. You can choose, and, and this is another one of those things where we would have loved to have been able to isolate, well, this percentage of that percentage is gonna go here and this other stuff's gonna go there. It's like I said, it's a planning tool. We're trying to ballpark the calculations. So animal feed can be chosen, if, especially in, in smaller jurisdictions that might not have access to certain facilities. Right. You know, you're not gonna use the RDRS record stuff. You're gonna use the non-RDRS records. And that way they can plan for a certain amount of onsite, a certain amount of community composting, a certain amount going to animal feed. Uh, we yeah. tried to, to build a tool that would allow that, but you know, it's, it's not perfect that, you know, I wish it was, there's a lot of no. other stuff we would have liked to have done, but it would have gotten very yeah. unwieldy and not very user friendly if we had tried. Right. High level. Right. And I appreciate your time. And, um, and we do appreciate all your hard work and we're very excited to assist and yeah, no, thank you for your time. All right. Thank you for your question. Now we're going to go back to Trishana Robinson, who had some follow up questions. Trishana, please unmute yourself. You're unmuted on our end. State your affiliation and ask your follow up questions. Okay, I'll go ahead and ask them. Um, second question, earlier Kara mentioned that the county is responsible for quote, rolling up the data 
into totals. I just wanted to clarify if these totals are to be rolled up by jurisdiction or by overall county. Thank you. Sure. Hey, great question. Um, and we will be sharing as soon as it's ready, mockups of um, the, the reporting that will um, be included in the electronic annual report. Um, but in the regulations, what the county reports on, um, so each jurisdiction is going to provide the county the tons estimated for organic waste, we can talk edible food separate, but for organic waste, the tons estimated that will be disposed, the amount of capacity that's verifiably available um, to that jurisdiction, that's your existing new or expanded capacity that you verified, and then the, the, the delta, that amount of capacity that you don't know where it's coming from, um, and th that total. Um, also, um, you will inform the county of any locations that you have identified that will be new or expanded facilities. And if um, uh, so, that's that's the data. The county will also report on the jurisdictions that reported that they have um, a capacity that hasn't been verified. Um, those jurisdictions will be reported by the county. And um, also, if uh, the county had a situation where a jurisdiction did not provide the required information within the 120 days, they would report that information as well. So again, it's really, really going to be important for the counties to be communicating with all of the jurisdictions in the county about the timeline, about how to submit information to the county, and what information should be submitted to the county. Important for um, the county and the jurisdictions to meet on somewhat of a, a, a regular basis, and you know, not maybe too often, but um, you know, at least at the beginning, and maybe uh, you know, once or twice during, um, so that everyone is on the same page. We've also in our trainings have talked to you about the importance of dividing up particular tasks that are necessary. Um, some cases it makes sense for the county staff maybe to be collecting certain data and then individual jurisdictions to be collecting certain data. So all that collaboration and planning is the responsibility of the county to lead that effort and to communicate to the jurisdictions about the data that needs to be submitted and the timeline that the county needs that data so that it can compile this information and submit its report to CalRecycle by August 1, 2022 for the first report. So I hope that answered your question. Please let us know if there's any follow-ups. Next question is from David Briggs. You are now unmuted. Please uh, ask your question. Uh, yes, thanks for allowing me to add another. Um, and I'm with, I'm with Napa County, by the way. Um, when will the 2020 RDS data be available for jurisdictions to use the calculator tool? 2020 is already out there. I believe it was released uh, about a month ago. If you're wondering about 2021, uh, 11 months or so. <laughs> because, but based on when the final fourth quarter reporting period comes in, and then the initial sort of uh, power cycle review, if Dan's still on the line, he could verify the exact date. But I believe it's the uh, early mid-May. Uh, yeah. Yeah, actually, uh, year-end data is released out of RDRS at the end of April, and it's available if you uh, go to CalRecycle's main website, search RDRS on that page. There should be a link to RDRS public reports, and you'll be able to see all the jurisdiction data there. Okay. And in the so, calculator tool, in the tool tips, um, there's links to the RDRS reports where you can look that up as well. Okay, well, given the timeline, it, it sounds like, Chris, um, the counties, we need to get our requests for the information out to the cities, which is a four-month period. It sounds like we should assume, we should even suggest to the cities that the 2020 data is what they use because they need to get going on this. Yeah, that, and, and that's, you know, part of the, the beast we had to deal with here, whereas 876, at least the reporting mm -hmm. and the data could correspond with the year release each year. This one is on a much wonkier timeline. So put in the 2020 data, maybe say, hey, you know, it, you got 20,000 tons this year, assume next year you'll have 21. And you, know, you don't necessarily tell them that. We don't tell them that. It's sort of, you know, it's, it's do your best on it. Cause we, it's, yeah. it's, it's, you're planning for the future. It's not, yeah. it can't be exact. And if you try to do that, 
you'll never get it done <laughs> because it's not going to be exact. All right, good recommendations. Thanks again. Mm -hmm. Going back to the SLCP inbox, we received a follow-up question from Anna Kramer of Imperial Western Products Incorporated. They ask, are there any plans for capacity tools for animal feed and is this the county or district responsible for providing that number to CalRecycle? You know, we'd love to hear more from you if you have ideas. We don't have anything planned. Um, again, um, jurisdictions would, you know, uh, really look at what their local options are um, for capacity and if animal feed is one of them, um, you know, they would include that in their data. So let us know, please, uh, you know, if you want to do a follow up, we'd be happy to do that offline. Next question we have is from Anika Anderson. You are unmuted. Please ask your question. Yeah, so my question is regards to um, materials in which jurisdictions don't necessarily know the capacity for um, in terms of the market. So, for example, textiles might be marketable in some parts of the state, but not necessarily robust throughout the entire state. So I wanted to see what you guys suggest when it comes to capacity planning. So I will say now, I actually intentionally kind of glossed over that um, when I was showing the waste characterization table, because I didn't want to unnecessarily confuse anyone. But textiles and carpet, while considered organic material for the purpose of establishing the statewide baseline and what would need to be diverted, material uh, carpet and textiles are not required to be uh, capacity planned in this sense. So when you look at the um, waste characterization table in the calculator, when you get to the end in the miscellaneous section, those two are specifically not included because there's there's no planning requirement for them. Okay, great, thank you. Sure, and I uh, just put the section um, into the question and answer box for you, Annika, so you can reference that. Awesome, thanks so much, Kara. Sure. The final question we have in our queue so far is from James Burnley. James, you are now unmuted. Please go ahead and unmute yourself from your end, state your name, affiliation, and ask your question. All right, thank you, everyone. Uh, James Burnley, City of Beverly Hills. I just had a question regarding the intent of the tool is to determine how much uh, capacity for organics in the region. And if that's so, if there's not enough capacity, will jurisdictions be granted <clears throat> more time because they don't have a place to take their organics? Yeah, hey James, thank you so much for your question. Um, a little, you know, kind of similar to Neil's question and uh, a couple others. Um, so the, the answer is yes. Um, so the regulations are designed such that Cal Recycle has discretion um, on uh, when it takes enforcement action. So uh, if Cal Recycle conducted a compliance evaluation of, say, your city, and determined that there was a gap, in this case, capacity, say, for green waste, um, then CalRecycle, again, if it, uh, in determining uh, next steps, could trigger the enforcement process. That enforcement process has a specified time frame, and that time frame can be up to three years um, if infrastructure is part of the issue. So again, it's um, that is the the timeline that's laid out in the regulations, but it's the the time before that as to you know when CalRecycle conducts that compliance evaluation, and then if CalRecycle determines that an enforcement action is necessary, then that that clock would start. So I, I put a lot of caveats in there um, just to uh, uh, give you the whole the whole uh, picture. I hope that helps. And Kara, if I could just add to to that, yeah. um, we're always uh, have an open door policy for folks that they want to come and talk to us about their barriers that they are encountering with 1383. It's always good that we kind of brainstorm together on some of these things. So, for example, if we know you know that there is a lack of capacity somewhere, and truthfully, Kara's group knows all these jurisdictions a lot, so they know where the lack of capacity is. 
But if there are some issues with 1383, um, we're always happy to have these conversations with you guys. It's always good that we know these barriers too and know what we're potentially gonna see in 2022. So it isn't a surprise to us as well. So James, if you ever wanna reach out um, to Jennifer Wallen's group and Kara to just talk about some barriers that Beverly Hills um, is encountering with 1383, we're always here to listen and uh, provide um, kind of some assistance in that standpoint. So I hope that helps James, um, but we do wanna know what these barriers are. No, thank you. And I appreciate all you guys' hard work. Thank you. Okay, hey, and now we have another question from Colleen Foster. You are unmuted. Please unmute yourself and you can ask your question. Thank you. And thank you again for answering all the questions. Colleen Foster, City of Oceanside. Uh, Ashley, I think a, a couple dozen, hundred of us cities would love that therapy session with you. So anytime I'll join in on that. But um, you know, actually going back to, I, I'm sorry I didn't get his name, but there was a county representative that just said a few months ago that it sounds like these cities really need to get on it right away to be able to fulfill their reporting requirements to the county and the county to reconcile that. But then a few minutes prior to that, you know, a county, another county agency said, well, we're still working on it. We hope to have it ready for our cities, but at least we have six months before we have to do that. So. I, I think that goes back to my comment earlier, really creating a set timeline and best management practices for counties across the state. So there is equitability for these jurisdictions as we have a, a race to compliance very soon. So more of a comment, not sure if it's a question, but- Yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. Yeah, yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. And that's why we're doing the statewide webinar that's why the land staff are reading, reaching out to their jurisdictions because ultimately, um, you know, doing the capacity planning is the jurisdiction, individual jurisdiction's responsibility. Um, the county does have this reporting requirement and collaboration piece, et cetera, but ultimately each jurisdiction needs to be planning for their programs and for the capacity that they're going to need. So we're doing our best to get these tools rolled out We'll be doing some follow-ups with land staff after this for jurisdictions that may need some additional support and help um, and understanding the calculator tool, et cetera. So, you know, it is a shared responsibility and um, it's really critical and vitally important um, and that, that each individual jurisdiction is beginning their capacity planning on the timeline that, um, you know, they feel is necessary. You know, some jurisdictions are maybe working on some other aspects of their program implementation and We'll be tackling capacity planning coming up. Some have already started their capacity planning efforts. So you know, we have quite a variety across the state. Um, the key is, is that the, the counties will need to submit this data by August 1, 2022. So jurisdictions will need to get that data to the county so that they can submit their report by August 1, 2022. So, you know, there is time, um, but there are a lot of priorities on all of your plates um, to accomplish a lot. So I encourage each of you to be also be thinking about your own timelines for uh, utilizing the calculator um, to um, conduct your estimates um, um, based upon what your particular circumstances are. And as I mentioned, if there's any follow-up, any of you have a need to go over the, the calculator tool or have specific questions, please uh, reach out. You can reach out directly to Jeffrey McDaniel or through the SLCP inbox and, and Jeffrey will be available to answer any of your questions related to the, the calculator tool and how to use it. So I hope that's helpful. Thanks so much for your comment. I really appreciate it. I will like to add an emphasis that Jeffrey helped write a lot of the instructions and the tips. Uh, I helped do the design. We've been really, really busting it uh, time-wise since I think November, December to get this out as early as we possibly could. And, and Jeff knows about 99% as much as I do on this calculator at this point. So he will be really good at that. And, you know, you can always check with your, your land rep and, you know, if we need to set something up, we can. We have one more question from the SLCP inbox from Steve Kozlowski with Greenleaf Power. They state, I'm curious how jurisdictions might be able to easily locate 
or find large scale end users of material like Desert View Power in Mecca. We are a woody biomass to electricity facility that consumes a significant tonnage of organic biomass waste annually. In the tool, RDRS displays us as, quote, green leaf power waste, uh, power desert view. Poster. Is there a way for jurisdictions to gain clarity as to what regional entities may be available for their specific capacity options and planning? Thank you so much, um, not only for that advertisement, for that great comment. Yeah, uh, you know, we we used to have um, a, a tool called FACET. We no longer have that. So, you know, uh, our, our best approach right now is, is word of mouth using our local assistance liaisons. Um, if you have capacity, if you are a facility, if you are interested in securing capacity, we encourage you to reach out to your local assistance liaison for that territory. We will get word out to the jurisdictions. We have set up a lot of one-on-one uh, -on -one or regional meetings between facilities and jurisdictions um, to you know, make that warm introduction. So we definitely um, continue to play that role, uh, including um, you know, recycling manufacturers like yourself, that you fall in that category, um, that either um, have capacity, are expanding, maybe building a new facility. So definitely reach out to Cal Recycle. We'd love to get word out to local jurisdictions. Again, because if there's available capacity, we wanna let jurisdictions know that um, so that they can be working to secure um, that capacity. Thanks so much, really appreciate it. And Ashley, I, are you wrapping up? I'll turn it back to you. Kara, we're gonna do one last question that we got oh, okay. in. Yep. Sure. So the last question we have for today is from the SLCP inbox, Dave Ghirardelli with Sacramento County. The question is, if a jurisdiction's capacity shortfall is due to a facilities or some facilities permitting holdup due to Cal EPA's own regulations, can the jurisdiction therefore receive a waiver or be given time before the compliance order timer starts ticking? Sure, Dave, thanks um, so much for that question. So as I um, explained earlier, the way it would play out is with respect to Cal Recycle's discretion uh, with respect to our enforcement actions. So again, if there was a particular situation, Cal Recycle is gonna take the totality of a jurisdiction circumstance into consideration um, as to whether or not we move forward with that enforcement clock or not. So while we can't give a waiver or a specific extension, we have that flexibility within the enforcement process um, to do just that. And so we, when looking at a jurisdiction conducting a compliance evaluation, we're gonna look at all of that situation, all of those scenarios, and uh, take that all into consideration. So I hope that's helpful, Dave. I know that Sac County is, is doing a lot um, to move forward with, with getting the necessary um, uh, capacity that's needed for that particular region. We really appreciate all of your efforts and everyone on the call today for all the work that you're doing to expand um, capacity in California so that together we can all meet the climate crisis head on and tackle it head on. Ashley, back to you. Perfect, thanks so much, Kara. Um, thank you guys all for your questions. These were all great. Again, we are available for more questions. Just email at Jeffrey McDaniel directly or the SLCP inbox. Um, just really quick plug on what's coming up next for Cal Recycle for 1383. We will um, be releasing a model electronic record keeping tool. So that's coming up within the next couple of months, along with those department issued waivers that Kara had addressed earlier during the webinar. Um, so please ensure you're signed up for the SLCP listserv as that's where we will get, be giving you the most up-to-date information. So thank you all and have a great afternoon and we will see you next time.